sometimes if there's a cure period in your contract where you got 30 days to uh, make up for what you did, then you're in default, but you're not in event of default. And then event of default is when you uh, can exercise remedies under the contract after all your cure periods have expired. Uh, so, I mean, obviously bad consequences, uh, they can be very different, but these are, there are two main ways of enforcing a real estate contract. We'll just keep going down the road, like second from the back, yes, you. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know. <laughs> okay. In the back, either of you? Um, I'm guessing just this group. Okay, you can sue. Okay, where the there's two main theories of suing somebody on a real estate contract. Any idea what one of them might be? You want them towards. Towards is a. I mean, if you're if you're suing on the contract, you're suing on the contract. Towards is like a slip and fall, or your gross negligence, or you intentionally harm somebody. But uh, the two main ways of enforcing a contract are damages. You lost money because of what the other person did or specific performance. You want to force the other person in your contract to perform. Okay, this can come up in purchase and sale contracts. Um, I actually um, was just involved where a buyer um, wanted the seller to sell them property but the buyer hadn't delivered all the things that it was supposed to deliver um, and yet still wanted to force the seller to close. So it sued for specific performance um, to get the seller to convey the property. Um, and that's still actually uh, in the court system. But um, so specific performance, you're trying to get somebody to perform. Damages, you're trying to get money. Uh, so how do you know who has legal rights in real property? Um, I, raise your hand if you've ever bought property. Okay, all right, there we go. So what did your agent do or what did you do to make sure that the person that was selling you the property actually owned that property? Yes. You like handed the rights over to us? Yes. Um, like signing the lease or signing the contract? Um, okay. So in real estate uh, in the United States, um, and let's just take California specifically, every county, including Los Angeles County, has a county records. And in the records are recorded deeds of all of the different uh, parcels of property in the county. And there are unincorporated areas like Santa Clarita, but they still have a reporting system and they still have a unincorporated area reporting uh, recorder's office. And so you record a deed of trust or, uh, or a, a grant deed or a special warranty deed, deed of trust being the secure loan, but a deed will actually convey property. So when you buy a house or you buy a condo or you buy a building or you buy a hotel or you buy a piece of land, you want to first pull title through a title company. Um, so you want to pull title from the county official records, and there are title companies, title insurance companies that do that. They provide that service. It's not very expensive to contact a title company like First American or Chicago Title. Those are the two biggest ones. Um, so you contact the title company, and oftentimes if you're buying a home, your real estate agent will contact the title company for you, and they'll pull all of the documents that are reported against the property that you think that you are purchasing. And one of the things that you want to check and make sure of is that your seller actually owns, is the record owner of the property that you're buying. So you'll use the county's official records to verify who owns the property. And when you are transferring the property, if you're the buyer, 
when you're getting that property, you want to make sure that your name or the name of your company is reflected properly on the grant deed and that that grant deed gets recorded. Now, have a, raise your hand if you've been to the Los Angeles County Recorder's Office, right? No one has. Nobody goes there except the title companies. They go down there and they record your, they get in line and they record your deeds uh, or your deeds of trust if you're a lender. Um, now, a lot of counties have digital recording, so sometimes they'll be sending the, uh, the deed by email, but uh, a lot of times these counties still require you to line up and uh, for recording your deed or your deed of trust. Yes. Are you allowed to go to a county clerk's office and request a uh, property deed? Uh, are you, yes, you could go down to the, uh, the county recorder's uh, office and you could request uh, a deed. You have to have the parcel number that you're looking to request the documents that are recorded against that parcel. But yes, you could do it on your own. Um, but you want to call in advance, make sure you have all the information about the property that you want to pull title on. And then, you know, make sure that they have, will allow you access and when you can get access. But it, again, it's like, I think the last time I had it done on a residential uh, property, it was about $50 to have a title company do it. So it's, uh, and they, that way you don't have to go down to the county recorder's office. So it'll just pull the title. The title company just offers convenience pretty much. Yes, yes. And, uh, and they know, everybody at the county recorder's office, right? So they already know the procedure. They're able to get it done much faster. They're able to uh, know where to search because uh, county recorder's uh, uh, offices index things in a certain way, kind of like a library with the Dewey Decimal System. Uh, their book numbers, page numbers, and all, all kinds of identifying uh, uh, nomenclature that's used in the county recorder's office. So, um, but my recommendation is that you use a title company if you're looking into buying property. Okay, so what are the types of interests in real property? In property class in law school, this is the bucket, uh, the bundle of sticks, right? You've got a bunch of different sticks of ownership, right? Uh, so, or uh, rights to use property. And I don't really think that, so law school is very, much uh, you'll learn a lot of stuff that was maybe relevant in the 1700s uh, but maybe not so much today like the bundle of sticks there's really only a few types of interests in real property and so it's probably better to just start there with what actually happened so we'll go back we're all the way back around to you sir in the front any any idea what kind of interest you could have in real property you probably have an interest in real property right now. Yeah, I just couldn't put a name on one specifically. Okay. Do you have an apartment? Uh, no, I live on campus. Okay. You live on campus. Mm -hmm. um, all right. If you lived off campus, what sort of interest would you have in your apartment? You probably sign a document called a... I, um, oh, oh. Yeah. No, no, no. Lease. <laughs> Good. Okay. So leasehold is one sort of interest. Do you have a uh, freehold? Okay. So, yes, you might be from the 1700s because it was called freehold, but now we call it fee. It's a fee interest. Uh, fee simple absolute is the legal term. But yes, a fee interest in a property is what we would typically associate with ownership. Maybe that might be something from England because I look at other property websites and I think the UK, they call it freehold. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Uh, you can, okay, so maybe uh, you might not have a time machine. You might just have a, you know, be looking at UK properties. Okay, any, uh, I'll open it up. Anybody have any idea what other kind of interests you could have in real property? Okay, I'll give a, an example. I have a house and in my backyard, um, their, well, my neighbor's backyard is actually, I own their backyard. It's a weird arrangement, but I can't use it. Anybody have any idea why I can't use property that I own? Yeah. Um, 
You're getting there. It's an e word. Easement. That's right. My neighbor has an easement over that property. It's an exclusive easement. And so now I can't use it. They have exclusive rights. And that's the right outcome because it's it's their backyard. So sometime in history, my property and their property were probably owned by the same people. And then they built two houses and they deeded one prop one section of the property and they did it wrong and they realized it later on and used an easement. Yeah. Sorry. Um, well, it's a it it's what's called an exclusive easement. Um, an easement in gross. Yes, I you know it is a legal term. Um, I don't I wouldn't use it. Um, yeah. Yes. So you can contract for that though, right? But in the easement that was done, it was not contracted that they would pay a certain percentage of the property taxes that's commensurate with the square footage of that area that's subject to the easement. Yes. So the difference between a leasehold and an easement is that a leasehold is owned by one person exclusively and an easement is when multiple people share the property? No, you can no. have an easement where it's just one person that gets to use. An easement can benefit another parcel or it can benefit an individual. So there are different types of, of easement and uh, easement and gross is one type of easement. You can have a personal easement or you can have an easement that runs with the land. And that's so that even it benefits whoever ends up owning that property. Um, so these are, you know, without getting, you could actually, there is about a month spent in, in law school on easements, but um, these are the basic types of ownership. Fee ownership or freehold in the UK, an option, you can have an option to purchase real property. You can have a leasehold, like your lease on your apartment. You can have an easement like my neighbor on their backyard. You can have restrictive covenants. These are all, when you pull title on a commercial property, you'll oftentimes find uh, covenants uh, either granting access over your property or uh, allowing your property to uh, get access to a street through another property or saying that you can't use your property for certain reasons or certain, certain uses. Um, so that's why that's one of the many reasons why you want to read all the documents that are on title before you buy or finance the property. Uh, and then condominium is another uh, way of uh, owning property. So you, you might own a property that's subject to a condominium regime or a condominium association. Uh, I don't want to get into too much detail, but um, that's it on the basics. Uh, so I'll take questions on any of the sort of basic stuff that we just discussed now before I go into purchase and sales. Do we have any questions from the Zoom people? No, nothing so far? Okay. Then uh, I'm gonna go straight into purchase and sales. Um, so does any, uh, I think there's one person that's said they bought property, right? That's you. Do you remember the basic timeline of what happened when you were buying a property? I know it was like five years ago. Okay. So my parents had been there with it. Okay. So like we worked with an agent and like went through different like documents and analyzed different deals and then eventually like made an offer with the agent who was working with. Okay. Okay. All right. So the um that's it. That's a good background. But if you're buying commercial property, even um this this can be applicable to residential property. The basic timeline is going to be you're going to enter into a letter of intent, typically or a term sheet. So that letter of intent will express certain terms that will be in your purchase and sale agreement. And oftentimes that LOI will be paired with an access agreement 
which will allow you onto the property as the potential buyer to start doing some diligence, right? Um, you're gonna want to inspect the property, come on, bring your environmental consultant, bring your property condition report uh, provider, bring whoever else uh, that you're hiring to look at that property for you, your inspector. Um, so you've got an LOI, an access agreement, um, say you want to move forward what's kind of the, the main document in the purchase and sale i've kind of given you a large hint there uh let's start there what's the main document that's going to govern your purchase and sale after you've signed a term sheet or an loi an access agreement and you said yes I, I, we're going to move forward what are you going to enter into I don't know what it's called, but I know that you need to do the bank and approve. Okay, all right, all right. Well, any idea what agreement would govern a purchase and sale? No, I just know that they need a credit check to pay All right, I, yes, that's wrong. Uh, well, you'll have an escrow agreement. That's true. A purchase agreement. A purchase and sale agreement. That's right. I was giving huge hints there. So purchase and sale agreement is the next step. So you get an LOI, you get your access agreement, you want to move forward, you're going to start negotiating a purchase and sale agreement. And anybody know what you as a buyer are expected to do when you enter, when you enter into a purchase and sale agreement? actually really useful like when you, you go to buy a property you're gonna need to know this any idea you sign your PSA you open escrow who said escrow yes why did you open escrow you want to make sure that the well the seller needs to make sure that they get the buyer's money and the buyer correct to get the house yes Yes, and at, when you sign a purchase and sale agreement, you're going to be expected to put up a deposit, okay? So that two, three, five percent, it can be bargained for. You know, you can bargain for the amount of the deposit, but the uh, seller is going to expect the buyer to put up a deposit in escrow. And that's um, to like, it's often called a good faith deposit in the residential uh, arena. So you've gone from an LOI and an access agreement, and maybe you didn't sign the access agreement. Maybe you signed the LOI and you have confidence that you're ready to go to the PSA stage and you, you've entered into a purchase and sale agreement, and maybe your access agreement will be in the purchase and sale agreement, or it'll be incorporated by reference in your purchase and sale agreement. You'll put up your deposit as the buyer, as the seller, you'll make sure that that deposit goes into escrow. Escrow is now open. And what is the period called from when you, the buyer puts up its deposit into escrow until you get to the actual transfer of the property? And any idea what, what comes next? You got, you got 30, 45 days. Sometimes now in residential purchase and sales, well, at least when the market was really hot, you, you could go down to like five, 10 days. Any idea what you're doing over the next little period of time? It is an escrow period. There's, you've got a deposit in escrow. Are you just sitting around as the buyer? What are you doing? Due diligence, that's right. It's your due diligence period. So after you enter into your PSA, your purchase and sale agreement, and you have uh, your deposit with escrow, now you're doing your diligence. Um, okay, and then say your diligence period expires and you have decided that you wanna purchase the property or your attorney or your real estate agent has messed up and not said that you want to withdraw your deposit and that due diligence period has expired. Um, then what's what comes next? Any ideas? Closing the sale. Closing, yes. Closing comes after uh, after the due diligence period. 
So there will typically be a, a, a small period of time between the end of the due diligence period and your closing. And that's when everybody's scrambling to get all the closing documents together. And then um, you will close and break escrow with money transferring um, from one party to the other, a deed transferring from one party to the other. And then um, in the commercial context, you'll have a bill of sale, a perfta, you'll have a bunch of other documents. Um, but after closing, when you buy, let's say, a hotel, or let's say a, a retail a shopping mall, or an apartment building, there are all kinds of things that the previous owner has to pay, right? There's property taxes, there's uh, security deposits for tenants, there's, uh, there's insurance for the property, there's uh, maintenance agreements, there's all kinds of agreements. And so one of the main, the easiest one to envision is property taxes. What happens if you have a very um, responsible owner that's selling their property and they just, the first day the property tax bills come out, they just pay both the, the first half and the second half. In, in California, you get two property tax bills split into two, One's due by one point in the year, the second's due by another point in the year. So what if the owner paid both of them? So they paid the entire year of property taxes. Is that fair to the seller? If the buyer just gets to come in and not have to pay property taxes for say nine months. Does that make sense? No, that's kind of a windfall. So you often with the purchase and sale have a true up and the true up you know, can you can um, uh, you can try to solve these types of problems at the closing, and you can apportion value. You can um, take credits on your purchase price, um, but oftentimes you'll miss something, right? And so, a purchase and sale agreement will often build it in a true up about ninety days or one hundred twenty days after the closing. For any of these little expenses that were prepaid or that you didn't know about or you forgot about. Um, and so everybody comes to a, 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 a meeting and you, you present, well, now it's by email, and you uh, present what you think needs to be trued up, you agree on it, and then uh, sometimes uh, there can be a holdback from the purchase price. And you end up um, dispersing that money to who it's supposed to go to. So, um, has anybody raised your hand if you've seen a purchase and sale agreement? Oh, good. All right. Um, I'm glad you have one. Um, so, when you saw the purchase and sale agreement, do you have any? Do you have any recollection of what the purchase and sale agreement, what the different sections were? So, I remember at the top it had um, seller or the good. lender. Yes, um, that's a good start. Buyer, broker. Good. Um, yeah. No, Probably. I just want to present it goes on further than towards the bottom, and there's another section that repeats basically all the same parties. Okay. All right. That's all. I'm going to go right behind you. What um what would you want to know as a buyer? What would you want your seller to say to you in that purchase and sale agreement? Any ideas? Okay, back row. Uh, so if you've got a purchase and sale agreement, we're, my question is, what are the basic elements of a purchase and sale agreement? What do you, if, and, and looking at it from, just put yourself in a buyer's position. You're buying, let's say a hotel in downtown Los Angeles. What do you want your seller to tell you in that purchase and sale agreement? Yes, um, the We got someone on Zoom saying the purchase price. Good, a price. All right, here, here we go. You parties, which uh, were identified already. So you want your buyer, your seller, your escrow company, possibly your real estate agent. Um, you want to identify the property. Remember in the first part, we identified that in the basics principles of real estate law, that in order to have a, an enforceable real estate contract, 
that you need a you need a property described with sufficient specificity. So that's oftentimes a legal description. So you want the property. You want the property described that you're buying or you're selling. You want uh, the amount of the deposit and the amount of the purchase price. Um, you want to de clearly define what that due diligence period is going to look like. Okay, how long is it going to be? What kind of due diligence can you do? Right? Uh, can you? There's a lot of oil and gas underneath the ground in the Los Angeles area, right? Are you going to allow, if you're a seller, a buyer to come on and, and drill down and see if there's oil and gas underneath your property? I wouldn't. I, I've had a client that had a methane pocket that was discovered by a potential buyer in their parking lot. That's a terrible outcome. There's not much you can do about that, but now it's there. Um, so you, you want to define the scope of what that due diligence is going to look like and what you as the seller have uh, uh, consent rights over. So like taking core samples, you as a seller, you're going to want a consent right before your buyer goes on and starts drilling holes in your property. Uh, you're going to want, if you do agree to that, you're going to want them to return the property to the condition that it was in before they started doing their environmental testing. Um, and uh, like I said, the length of the due diligence period is also important. So reps and warranties. This is one of the more contentious areas of uh, a PSA. Um, you can imagine that as a buyer of real property, you want the seller to tell you certain things that if they're not true, you can sue them over that, right? So what are some things that, and can anybody think of anything that you would want to know your, your seller to tell you is true in a purchase and sale contract if you're buying property? Let's go back to that hotel in downtown Los Angeles. You're buying a hotel in downtown Los Angeles. What do you want your seller to tell you in that document? Yeah, the maybe the ventilation is working um, and that every. No code violation. Okay. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Can you speak up a little bit? Oh, Liens or, or uh, third party interest in the property. That's a good one. Um, if they're planning to take a flood, um, this applies to the legacy appliances for the appointments. Okay. Like, you want to know what you're getting. Right, you want to. That's the description of the property. Is is it's underestimated how important that is. You, um, in the context of I dabble in life sciences, right? And you've got these clean rooms in any life sciences campus or life sciences office space. Um, and there's a lot of equipment. And who owns that equipment? Does the tenant own that equipment? Uh, does the owner own the equipment? Right? And is it a fixture? Fixtures are part of the, the property. Um, and do they have rights? Do, do tenants have rights to remove those fixtures? So you're going to want to read the leases that are on the property. We have a uh, Zoom question. I think that is. Okay. There it is right there. As a seller, how much research do you do into the environmental aspects of land and property before taking on the list? Okay, so this sounds like uh, the question is, as the seller, how much research do you do into environmental aspects of the land prior to taking on the listing? So it sounds like we're talking about an agent situation. Um, so it depends. The answer is it depends. Um, oftentimes, the uh, sell, well, the seller acquired the property from somebody, unless you are in a family that has inherited property down through the ages, you have probably acquired your property from somebody else. And the average home used to turn over in seven years. Commercial properties turn over all the time, okay? So when you acquired your property, you did certain diligence. The expectation will be that say the phase one environmental report or any environmental diligence will be made available to the buyer. So as the seller's agent, 
you will likely put up a data room or send the buyer's agent um, by email um, PDFs of some diligence documents, which will probably include the environmental report that you produce. Now, it, it's highly dependent on the situation that you're in, but typically you would not, as the seller, perform a new environmental or seller's agent, perform a new environmental inspection of the property that you're marketing. That would be the buyer's diligence. So they would procure their own report and they would need to be able to rely on that report. Um, so it would need to be addressed to the buyer so that they could then sue the uh, environmental report provider if it uh, proves to be uh, false or misleading or fraudulent. Okay, so um, going back to the elements of the purchase and sale agreement. So reps and warranties, you want, a, you want basic corporate representations that the, the LLC or corporation entering into the contract has the authority uh, to enter into the contract. It's been duly authorized by the people who need to authorize it within the corporation or the LLC or the limited partnership. Um, and you want basic reps regarding the property. Um, and as the uh, buyer, uh, you want the same basic corporate authority reps of, um, well, as the seller, you want the same basic corporate authority reps from your buyer so that you know that you have a real legal entity that is, has it put it, uh, that you're entering into this contract with. Um, you'll have terms that govern the closing and the conditions to closing. So the um, due diligence period is not your only opportunity as a buyer to get out of your contract. Um, there's also closing conditions. So if you're going to buy property and the seller doesn't come to the closing with, you know, there's usually a laundry list of about 20 different things. If they don't have all of those items in, then you don't have to close and buy the property. Right, so the closing conditions are very important. That's another very important aspect of your purchase and sale agreement. And then remedies. Um, oftentimes, uh, the remedies in a purchase and sale agreement will be very limited. Uh, the seller's remedy will often be limited to the deposit, right? So the buyer will lose their deposit if they fail to close or they breach. Um, the seller will want to limit their remedies um, after you close. Basically, you can't sue the seller. Now, certain reps and warranties uh, prove to be false after you buy a property. Um, the purchase and sale agreement will give you sort of limited recourse to the seller. Um, there's oftentimes a cap on that or um, it, it's called a bucket or a cap. Right, so there may be an aggregate amount that you can recover from your seller as a buyer if they've lied to you, um, or uh, you might have a cap on how much you can recover for false reps. Um, then there's also a specific performance. When you get to the closing table and somebody, either the seller refuses to convey or the buyer refuses to buy, if you fulfilled all your promises under the PSA, you can sue for specific performance. Um, so that's that's the basics of um, uh, the what your uh, your PSA will look like. Now the next thing we're going to deal with is who controls the deposit, right? So this is an important thing. That two or three percent in Los Angeles, if you're buying a two million dollar house, that's that's a fair amount of money. You might be putting up sixty thousand dollars of cash. And who controls, who's, let's start with who's holding that money. Do we remember from earlier? Escrow. Escrow will be holding that money. If you're a buyer and the seller says, no, I want to hold that money, you should run the opposite way, okay? Escrow, a third party subject to an escrow agreement should hold the money, that deposit. Um, and now at the beginning of the due diligence period, who controls that deposit? Any idea? Your due diligence period is still open. It hasn't run, haven't delivered a, a letter saying that you're, you want to close. 
you're just in the middle of the due diligence period. Does the seller or the buyer really control that due diligence money? Any ideas? Yeah. I'm the seller. Uh, no, not the seller. Remember, you let's say you're buying a two million dollar house and you just put up uh, forty thousand dollars. Let's say it's a two percent deposit. You put up forty thousand dollars in escrow. You're in the due diligence period. Essentially, you can pull that money and walk away. But what happens when the due diligence period expires? If you walk away, that uh, that deposit is going to go to your seller, okay? Because they have certain circumstances accepting, but that's sort of the bargain that you've made. I'm going to conduct my due diligence when that expires. I'm if I don't object. Uh, we're going to close. And then if you don't close as the buyer, then the seller has kept the property off the market for that due diligence period. And while that you've said that you're going to buy the property, so that's their compensation. That That's kind of their, their hook that they have in you as a buyer, is that at the end of that period, that you, you could lose that deposit. Um, so that's the basics of the deposit. Um, now what, let's talk about the property. Um, these are the, the, this is the basics really of the property. Like what, what are you getting? We talked about, is it a fee interest? Is it a condo? Are you buying a ground lease property? Um, are you getting the buildings? Are you getting all the fixtures? Do tenants have rights in the fixtures? Are you getting any other improvements? Um, are you getting, do you need the tenants to sign off on the transfer of property? So do you need agreements with the tenants to make sure that you're not gonna lose any leases? Um, let's say that hotel in downtown Los Angeles has ground floor retail. You wanna read those leases to make sure that when you buy the property, um, you don't need to give notice or um, the tenant doesn't have the ability to terminate if the ownership changes. So that's the sort of diligence you want to perform there. Then tangible personal property, like are you getting the artwork, you know, in the hotel? Are you getting the gym equipment? Are you getting any of the other uh, sort of property that goes into what the shopping center or the hotel or the office building is and then intangible personal property there's trade names books and records licenses permits websites right what you don't want to get into is a, a situation where you bought a property with a bunch of leases and there's a bunch of tenants and you didn't get the books and records or at least access to the books and records for a number of uh, years years back from before your purchase and then have a dispute where you have no way of proving what has happened what's been paid what hasn't been paid so that's why it's important to make sure that you at least have access to books and records going back a certain amount of uh years and for a certain amount of years you'll have licenses permits websites warranties you want to uh, consult with legal representation uh, to make sure that you're conveying those in the proper manner. Uh, so that's, we covered deposits, uh, we covered the purchase price. Um, let's see. Okay, so I think we're on to uh, what do you want for your closing conditions? Um, let's see. So what would you want to make sure like as a buyer or a seller that the other person brings to the table? Okay, when you get to the closing, what do you have? You have a deposit that's in escrow, you have a signed purchase and sale agreement, you have an LOI and you have an access agreement, okay? So now you're ready to close. What are the conditions, let's say as a seller, um, that you want before you're forced to convey your property, before your buyer can sue you for specific performance to sell that property. What do you, what's one really big, really important thing? Remember, the only thing that's in escrow right now is the deposit. 
Yeah. Okay, say we're actually closing. We're, we're at the closing and you're the seller. What's one closing condition that you absolutely must have? The purchase price, the money to close the deal needs to be in escrow. That's an important closing condition, right? You need the buyer to wire the full purchase price minus any uh, uh, sort of uh, credits that have been given on the purchase price. Uh, you want that money in escrow, right? And there's uh, the, as a buyer, what do you want to make sure the sellers put in? The most important thing that the seller can put into escrow. Nothing. The deed, good. The conveyance instruments, the deed, the bill of sale needs to be executed. It needs to be in recordable form. The title company needs to have verified that you can record it. So you want to make sure that all the conveyance documents are in escrow and you're, you put your money into escrow, the seller has put the conveyance documents into escrow, and then there's a whole host of other, uh, but those are really the most important ones. Um, all right, so what are you walking away from your closing with as a buyer? Any idea? Let, let's just go down this row again. This row has been very participatory. So what are you walking away with from a closing as a buyer? Like proof that moving forward, I'm buying. Okay, the deed. You probably, you, you want to walk away with a PDF of your signed uh, notarized deed and uh, some confirmation from title company that they've submitted a recording. What else as a buyer do you want to walk away from the closing with? Keys, yes, you want to make sure that you can get into your property, you have access to the property, but then there's also um, in, a, in the commercial setting, well, and in the residential setting, you want to make sure that you have title insurance. So you have a title insurance company that is ensuring that you will own the property upon recordation of that deed of trust. Um, you want as a buyer, your problem, if there's a property with a lot of tenants, you'll want estoppels, and that'll probably be a, given to you during the due diligence period. Uh, you wanna make sure that any third party approvals that are necessary for your, uh, your conveyance are executed in an escrow. Um, you wanna make sure that contracts that need to be terminated, that you've requested to be terminated, have been terminated. Um, you want to make sure that you have evidence that any damage to the property that you're, you required to be fixed has been fixed. Um, and then there's the purchase price and the, and the closing documents. Um, so that's kind of where you end up. Um, now, we went over this a little bit at the beginning, um, but what, what do you do as a buyer or seller, the other party to your purchase and sale agreement breaches that contract, right? You show up to the closing, you're the buyer, you wired your money in and your seller refuses to put the deed in escrow. What, you, you obeyed all of the provisions of the PSA, your deposits in there, your money's in there, you've delivered all the closing conditions. What's, what do you sue to do? Anybody remember this, the, the specific term that I'm talking about? Okay, specific performance. I was trying to give you a hint there. Specific performance is what you would sue as a buyer. You would say, I've done all my, I've filled all my obligations under this purchase and sale agreement. We're at the closing. Seller, you need to sell. Okay, and if you're a seller, and you put your deed in and your buyer um, has uh, refuses to put the purchase price in, it's a little bit different. You can't be forced to buy a property, right? Especially in the residential. I, I mean, you can try to sue for specific performance, but really your remedy is that deposit, right? So you, you can keep the deposit if the buyer decides to walk away. Um, 
Then there's also, we talked about suing for breach of contract and uh, you can also sue for damages. So that, that's it on purchase and sale agreements. Um, here's, the, here's the remedy slide, right to terminate, receive deposits, specific performance and recovery of costs. Um, and that's it, Mark Jeffries. They all, so who woke up this morning and thought to themselves, man, I want to learn about documentation. I want to learn how I can do a PSA or a deed of trust. Anybody? No. Did anybody wake up this morning and thought to themselves, I want to learn how to do this stuff because it's intrinsically interesting to me, more interesting than science, philosophy, literature, movies. Well, then you're, you're a unique fellow, my friend. So um, I myself, in my near shoes, had no interest in any of this. I was a philosophy English thing. But I realized that being homeless was not a good um, long-term strategy. So um, I decided I need to learn something that was useful. So went to law school and then um, after many years of suffering, I showed up here. So the thing I'm gonna teach you today or was give you some um, a few thoughts about, I'm not gonna walk through documentation step-by-step. Step. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about um, um, real estate investing, um, through a lending platform or otherwise, through a fund. And what it, and um, I'm gonna give you some context about what it means to have a fund in the context of real estate investments or real estate lending. And I'm gonna give you that context by talking about my own experience. So about six years ago, this guy over here and myself used to work at a law firm called Sibley Austin. The only reason it'd be notable is Obama used to work there, work at a different office, but kind of a little bit, you know, marquee thing for the firm. So one of my clients came to me and said, Mark, would you like to come on board with me and become our general counsel? General counsel is just a fancy name for like the, um, the top lawyer within a company. So I said, okay. So we started out with a blank piece of paper. We had no investors. We had no documents. We had some ideas, but no real business plan. So um, we were able to locate that and um, identify our first investor which um, is a large private equity shop. Um, and they invest, they agreed to um, invest in us a uh, quarter billion dollars, 20 million bucks. So we took that money and we hired a trader, we hired um, loan originators, we hired uh, people who were accountants, back office people, all of that to actually flesh out a team so that people could run invoices and wires, um, find loan opportunities like in a, in a minute. Um, do trading, I'll get that in a second as well. And so we kind of fleshed that out and we started something which called, essentially it's a CMBS shop. You ever heard of CMBS before? Well, you're kind of lucky because um, we almost brought down the national economy about uh, 10 years ago. Um, CMBS, it stands for Commercial Mortgage Backed Securities. And um, that essentially means go out and you make, you know, um, a loan on a strip mall, on a high-rise office tower, on an assortment of uh, multifamily companies or uh, properties. So, you know, one $10 million loan, $100 million loan, one $200 million loan. You bundle them together um, in a vehicle, usually a trust. And then that trust then issues bonds. And those bonds are purchased on Wall Street by investors. The advantage of that is that it allows the borrowers to be able to get fairly low interest rates you know, historically, it'd be like a year ago, 2%, 3% interest rates. Um, um, and, you know, it's, um, and allows for the investing team who made it to make a spread off of that, off, the, off of the money, so they can make a decent return. So anyway, we started CMBS Shaw. We generated a couple of billion dollars of, of mortgages and then started selling bonds. That was step one. And then step two, we started another platform, which is called Bridge and Event Driven Lending. And that, what we did was we um, wanted to make construction loans. We wanted to make loans for bridge loans. A bridge loan essentially means when a property is kind of, it's, it's been constructed um, and started operations, but it doesn't actually have all the tenants yet, or it doesn't have a robust cash flow. So you really can't get a, a low interest rate loan. So it's kind of, it's kind of a delta piece, it's transitional. And so, those bridge loans, we want to do those because you can charge anywhere between eight, nine, 10, 15 percent money um, to lend somebody fifty, hundred million dollars. Um, and so we started that platform. We went out and found some investors, a pension fund um, um, here in the United States, 
a sovereign wealth fund out of the Persian Gulf, an insurance company uh, from out of Israel, and we assembled about a billion dollars and started making loans on that um, using those monies. And so through all those activities, we were able to now, we now manage about, in terms of dollars, about two and a half billion dollars, um, which we've been accumulated over the past five years. And um, we also, at the same time, we started another business, which is a loan servicing business. So like, you know, you have a car loan or you have a house loan. When you send in your check, you're kind of sending it to your lender, but you're kind of really sending it to a loan servicer. Somebody who takes the money, counts it, debits it your account, keeps track of how much you owe, and then sends out statements and things like that. And there's a problem, then they you know, will work with you to either fix the problem or take away your property by book loan. So we started a loan servicing business to service our own loans and then started working on doing that for other companies as well. Right now we're managing about $12 billion of um, loans for ourselves and others. Now, the reason I'm talking about these numbers in this process is to show you how quickly things can scale in this. And then also to pivot to why it's important to somebody who actually wants to make a living. Um, and that when we started this, our value, our company is worth zero. Right now, um, our company was recently valued last week. I can't give the number, but I can say it is multiples of hundreds of hundred million dollars. And so that's five years of work. That's five years of work, you know, me working 70 hours a week, you know, for the past five years. But we've actually have a sizable company and we think we're going to have, we think we'll probably double that value in the next two to three years. So if you're a founder of something like this or a key employee, this translates into substantial wealth for you and your family. And so when you think about how to make money, how to become prosperous, how to get a career that sets me apart from everybody else who's doing the nine to five, you want to get a set of skills where you have knowledge and capacities that other people just don't have. And the reason is they haven't spent the time reading the books, reading the articles, going through the documents, learning the process, learning the technical aspects um, that will allow these things to work. The biggest reason people fail in terms of not doing well, well there are lots of reasons, but one of the biggest reasons they do do well in business in terms of funds or law or things like that, is they just don't spend the time learning how everything works, learning the process and mastering it. It's largely laziness. So, Dan Lisbon, unfortunately, is one of the hardest working people I know. And so he's a master of this, but it took thousands of hours over years for him to accumulate that knowledge. But now that he has it, he has something that he could sell per hour or, you know, um, or uh, otherwise. Um, just to give a context, I'm not going to say of Dan's rate, but if you're a lawyer and if you're really, really good um, at, you know, real estate or finance or fund formation, things like that, you can charge $900, $1,200, $1,500 an hour for your services. So that translates into a not a bad lifestyle. So when you start fading in class today or on Monday, keep your eye on the long-term ball. How do I become the best at this? So that people want to say, I need him or her, or actually you, um, to actually take over all my business for me because they know things I don't know and will never learn. Make sense? Kind of? All right, cool. So, and how do we go to the next one? Uh, use the arrows. Okay. Okay. People have heard of, um, of funds before, right? And of private equity. If I see another head go up and down, that'd be helpful. You? Perfect. And so what, what's a fund to you? A uh, fund is a pool of money that's linked to um, pull money from multiple people together and they want to uh, achieve a certain objective. That's right. For that money. That's right. That actually, that was really, really great. Um, and so there's all sorts of funds. I mean, some funds buy equities, you know, stocks, some buy properties, some make loans. My company makes loans when we buy properties. And so the way a fund operates is essentially this. Um, this is me. We're a private equity firm. So we have a team of people who know investors. We have lawyers like myself. We have accountants. 
We have business people who are experts in different areas, and they will identify different investment opportunities, and then they'll present those opportunities to a group of investors. The people in blue. There are different types of investors for different types of funds and um, different goals. We were lazy. We wanted large investors. We wanted people who could invest, not people, but entities, companies who could invest a quarter billion, half a billion, or a billion dollars. That's our focus. And the reason is, is that you could get a bunch of investors, like you know, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 dollars, but it just takes so well to aggregate that to a large amount of money. And there's so much administrative headache. It's kind of, if you can avoid it, do it. So what you do is you go out to your investors, you give them a thesis. This is what we want to do. This is our business plan for taking your money and how we're going to invest it. And these are the types of rates of return you'll receive. So for example, we'll go out to somebody and we'll say, hey, you give us $100 million. We promise that you will have a minimum return of 7%. Not promise. You got to promise anybody a return. But we'll say you will have a estimated base rate of return of 7%. But um, if our projections or investments go well, your rate of return will you know, go anywhere between 11 12, 13, 14%. So people then agree to that and then they'll give you money and then you'll start negotiating the process. There are different types of investors who require different types of things. From you. Like if you go to PIMCO or if you go to the Cox's or if you go to the Walton family and you ask them for money, they're going to have an entire set of processes and lawyers and accounts you're going to have to go through. All the same process for like, you know, um, a pension fund, we're going to have different sets of uh, people, different sets of processes. You're gonna have to, we're gonna screen you, screen your process, screen, they actually know what you're doing, and then agree to give you the money. So what you do is that you get um, one, two, three investors. So like, I'll give you an example. We have one fund right now where it's one investor and they have $900 million just by themselves in one vehicle. So that one vehicle is a, basically a fund of one. And so, Giant company, us, we combine this money into a fund vehicle, usually a limited partnership, can be an LLC, can be other types of, um, um, types of companies. Have you ever heard of an LLC or a limited partnership before? Okay, cool. So, um, so then you have this bundle of money and you have it in a vehicle. So then you go out and you make individual investments. For example, we made a loan of, I don't know. We made a ninety million dollar loan on um, some property in Texas last week. So what we did was that we set up an individual company, of, you know, an LLC, and that is where that became the lender, and that um, is the vehicle in which we contributed ninety million dollars in exchange for that. We got a lien on the property, and then they agreed to pay his interest payments until the loans were paid, and. For a strip mall in Des Moines, Iowa, we set up a different company. And for a multifamily, um, you know, an apartment building here in um, LA, it's a different company, different loan, different process. But they're all very similar. Anybody know why we would set up different companies um, do each one of these investments? I'll just say, yes, it's just for life, uh, life maybe it's for organizations that are keeping all the, uh, Loan servicing and everything in one fund, it's probably just easier to divide each investment up and keep track of everything individually. That, that's, a, that's a great answer. You, you're right. And so, um, if you um, have um, a bunch of eggs and you have them in one basket, you drop the basket, all the eggs break, it's a bad day for you because you've lost everything. So, a breaking basket or breaking egg is um, a metaphor for if you get sued. Um, by the borrower or by somebody else for whatever reason, you want to be able to limit the exposure of that lawsuit to just this vehicle, this LLC, so that they can't, until so they get a large award against you, then they can't go against this company or this company, or more importantly, this company. You want to be able to have corporate severability and you want to have limitations and um, um, how much they can attach, you know, you have a limitation on how much of your assets they can have access to if they get an award. Uh, so that's kind of the old, that's kind of a very generic structure for a fund. 
and a very generic structure for how investments are set up by the fund and how they're compartmentalized. So actually, let's take a step back. So in terms of documentation, what you're going to have, my other slide says, yeah, I'm going to skip forward in this slide right now. We talked about identification of investors. And I'm going to, um, we'll take it aside and we'll talk about um, different types of funds. Then we'll go into um, uh, fund documents. So actually, we already talked about this. Um, for different types of funds. Some are multi-member funds. We have some funds with you know three, four, five investors. Um, there are funds with thousands of investors. Um, and there's some where just a fund of one. It all depends on the, the, um, the amount that each investor has to invest and also the goal of the general partner and the fund vehicle itself. Whether you want to customize something, just one particular individual, i.e. a company, or if you want to have something very generic, like a Vanguard fund, where you could have thousands or maybe millions of people, you know, contribute their uh, money into the fund view. So these different, so essentially funds can be customized to meet specific objectives for um, the investor and for the general part. So once you have identified an investor, and once you have a, well, that once you have a strategy, then what we need to do is we need to do well, basically two, there's two key documents. One is essentially a limited partnership agreement, or an LLC agreement. That document is going to be anywhere from 40 pages to 200 pages. And it can cost you anywhere from $50,000 to a million dollars to negotiate in terms of legal fees. It's going to have a host of different items in it. It's going to have how it was formed, who are the limited partners, who has control, what's going to be the general partner, control being day to day administration of the vehicle. Um, um, and then also investment objectives and limitations of those objectives. So the manager is only can do those things that the investor has authorized, or in some cases, the investor can say, I need to approve every decision you make, which is more cumbersome, but it's not uncommon. And then they'll be something called a waterfall. The waterfall is going to have a bunch of provisions in there regarding here's if we have $100 come back, um, some of it will come back. In terms of your principal, how much you invested, then the profits are going to be split up in multiple different ways. They're so going to base return. After the base return is um, um, provided, then you'll have a split, a common split is 80 20. So if you have um, once you achieve your minimum return, let's say you have $100 million left, $20 million of that goes to the general partner, $80 million goes back to the investor. The nice thing with your own partner is that you haven't really had that much capital invested other than time and money of your employees. And so these promotes can be really sizable. And the promote actually flows through to key employees. And so if you are the head of um, a division within a fund, or if you're a key employee, or if you're a founder, then you'll get anywhere between one, five, ten percent of that promote sent straight to you. And the rest of it will go to the investors of the general partner. The other type of document you'll have is, that's also key to this, is we call it a subscription agreement. That's essentially um, 20, 30, 40, 50 page document that is a long list of representations by the investor. It says, you know, I'm an American citizen, or I am a company formed in the United States, or I'm a company um, formed in um, Bahrain. And then it will give information about the company, like, um, I don't launder money. Um, nobody in my company works with terrorists. We conduct um, investigations of all of our investors or employees to make sure that none of them are on watch lists by the U.S. government, um, the EU, um, you know, or other countries. Um, so once you have all of these representations, then and you'll feel comfortable enough as the general partner, then you can accept them as an investor. You don't want the representations just because you yourself want to feel comfortable. The representations are in order to satisfy regulators who are going to be um, watching you like a hawk. And we'll get to regulators a little bit later. Oh, one more thing. Um, the bullet point here is the types of fees. 
So a manager will charge different types of fees. One could be, um, you know, a management fee. So let's say um, some companies, it's not uncommon to see if you invest 100, you invest $100 million, then we charge 1% per year of the amount invested is just a management fee to manage your money. And then on top of that, you can have um, a loan servicing fee, you can have a loan origination fee, you can have a closed investment fee, a long list of, invest of fees that can actually add up and add to the bottom line of the general partner. But most of those fees are used to pay for operations, employees, office space, insurance, accounting, taxes, and all of that. So you have the investor, you have fund documents, you've agreed to, um, to have the investor come on board. So then you start operations. So what you do then is um, we'll, we will go through we'll get a little, which one I'll talk about first. So let's say you have anything, you're ready to start operations. So if you need to hedge your investments, they'll set up a trading desk. Does anybody know what hedging means? Yeah, absolutely. Um, best way is uh, well, I'll, uh, well, I'll talk maybe in maybe a hedge fund. Um, hedge fund is basically um, uh, or hedging your bets. Uh, your maybe you can talk about shorts or going against what um, is usual. Maybe like maybe you think of it as an insurance that if well, if the market slows down, the hedge is supposed to uh, make you money in if anything were to be negative in the normal market. That's um, right. That's right. Yes, yeah, so essentially a hedge, there's different ways of hedging, but essentially a hedge is that with a certain type of investment, and if that investment drops, you have purchased um, either a security or a, type of, a, a swap or a contract that says that when this investment goes down, the value of the hedge and the instrument go up so that the losses suffered on, on one side can be offset by the gains on the other. So you are in a neutral position. Hedging is very, very important if you are buying securities um, or have exposure while you're assembling products before going to securities because volatility can happen very, very quickly. I'll give you an example of that. Um, we have seen volatility in some of the securities our peers have purchased that on December 1st, it was worth, January 1st, it was worth, you know, $100. As of now, $80. And I've seen 20% markdown securities across the United States. You weren't hedged, you lost 20% of your investment money right away. So setting up a trading desk is really key if you're gonna be off selling securities and loans on real property are a type of security. Um, then you also have to set up then another process in which you identify assets, whether it's properties or loans you wanna make on properties. So you have to have loan originators, and then you have to have um, underwriters and you have to have an accounting team that all backstops that. They flush all the information together into, um, into uh, basically an investment memo, which is given to the investment committee, which are usually the senior people in the company. And they'll give a thumbs up or a thumbs down on an investment. So you have to set up a process of identifying opportunities, evaluating opportunities, making recommendations, that having those recommendations um, approved, I, you know, both internally and then also in some cases by your investors. In addition to all of that, as I mentioned earlier, you have to set up a back office and IT structure. So you have to have a broker fixed guy, um, like for your, for your laptop. You have to have an accountant. You have to have a human resources person. You have to hire an attorney, which is unfortunate. Um, you have to hire, you know, so you have to have this entire ecosystem of a business. So when you think about forming a fund or any you know, or a real estate investment company otherwise, you can't just think about, I want to buy a, a multifamily property. You have to think about the entire operation you need in order to be able to accomplish that. As an aside, you can farm a lot of that out to a fund administrator for a minimal fee. Problem with that is, is that um, they don't really care about you that much or know much about you. So they'll screw things up fairly commonly. And so, um, um, it depends on your risk appetite. Oh, I went way too far. 
went to um, fund operations. Um, the last thing I'll talk about is compliance um, issues. Um, I am a lifelong Democrat. And so I've always thought large government is helpful to um, people and individuals and um, um, regulate business is a good idea. I still want to feel that way. But now as a general counsel for investment fund, I'm really starting to hate government. And the reason is, is that um, the Securities um, Exchange Commission is like a sword over my head every day. And I'm always worried about a contract, an email, a conversation. Something goes wrong, the SEC can hear about it, swoop in, give us a fine, you know, um, send us to enforcement. It's a bad day. Uh, we also have the Federal um, Trade Commission, um, not sorry, the, the uh, Commodities Future Trading Commission also administers us because we buy swaps and certain types of commodities that fall under its purview. Also, we're regulated by 20 different state companies, um, state um, regulators. Um, lenders licenses, loan servicer licenses, business licenses, all sorts of things. And so they all want fees, they all want reporting. If you screw any of that up, they can come and take away your ability to do business in that jurisdiction, that state, or national. And so you need a, people like myself, a compliance team, who is going to be on this job every day in order to be able to make sure that your company and your individual your employees don't do anything wrong. One small Thing about that. Um, people often think, well, I'm an honest person. And so I'm honest, I'm, I'm forthright, that's good enough. I shouldn't worry about any of that. Wrong. Um, people can make mistakes that are violations of law without even knowing the law existed or even realizing it was a violation. So I was talking in the beginning of the conversation that you need to learn the technical aspects of what you're doing. Those technical aspects will protect you because you know the law, I know the process. Then you'll be able to protect yourself without this remedy. Anyway, I'm sorry I kind of rambled a little bit. They didn't get into much documentation, but I thought I'd give you kind of a more overview than a rather than a step by step process through a document. Hope that was helpful. All right. Uh, up next, we have Alex Davis. Uh, it's a partner in Mayor Brown. Uh, his specialty is joint ventures. You've got a lot of them. Um, and so we'll get to, there we go, Joy Fetchers. Thanks, Sam. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Alex Davis. I'm a partner at Mayor Brown, work with Dan. And so we're going to talk about Joy Ventures a little bit. So this is a, a topic that can take much more than 20, 25 minutes, however much we have. So I'm going to try to just scratch the surface a little bit. Uh, so let, let's just start this out. And ideally, this will be interactive. I'm going to ask you guys questions. I'd love to hear your thoughts and stuff. Uh, so just to kick it off, can anybody tell me what a joint venture is? Don't be shy. It's no wrong answers. Go for it. When two parties come together to pursue uh, financial interests. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what it is. Um, you could have a joint venture with two parties, three parties, four parties, but the idea is it's, it's more than one person pursuing some common goal. Um, and, okay, so if, if that's what a joint venture is, then why would people do that as opposed to just going at it alone? Any ideas? Maybe uh, two, uh, two different parties have very special, um, have specialization that can make issuing a common goal much easier. Yep, that, that's exactly right. So, yeah. Good work. Also, like, so there's so much Definitely. And, you know, when, when we see joint ventures in a real estate context, it typically comes up in one or two, one of two situations. You either have a development that's going to be built. And so you have a, what's usually referred to as the capital partner who's bringing all the money to the project. And then you have the, the operator partner or the developer partner who's responsible for actually building the thing out of the ground. Uh, that's one instance where you could have a joint venture in real estate. The other common area is what very large scale projects. So think, you know, high rise office tower that's going to cost, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to complete. Uh, even if um, it's already built, oftentimes the, the people that have that kind of money to buy an office tower 
they, they're typically not in the business of operating them. So you see a lot of pension funds or investment funds who own these office buildings, but they're not running the day to day. So they'll hire an operator partner as their joint venture partner. So, you know, we talk about joint ventures. When we think of that, I mean, is it usually that a joint venture is used for one project or multiple projects? Does anybody have a sense of that? So the answer is you can do it either way. Um, sometimes you have these arrangements called, called programmatic joint ventures. And essentially what that is, is the parties say, okay, you know, we think we want to do a series of deals with you. And you can set it up so that one joint venture entity could actually own multiple projects through subsidiaries. Um, typically, if you're going to be working with a new partner, you're typically not doing a programmatic joint venture. It's usually just a single joint venture. But it's important to, to kind of keep in mind that it's not necessarily limited to one project. And it's, just, it's a good idea to um, you know, kind of flush that out at the beginning of the relationship as to um, what the plan's going to be. So, so moving on here to manage. So and Mark was talking about in his section you know, how you have a, a limited partnership agreement or an LLC agreement. You have the, the governance of a fund. It's the same thing with a joint venture. Typically, it's going to be an LLC agreement. And in that document, it's going to describe the rights and the obligations of each of the partners. And one of the areas that is most highly negotiated is the management portion of it. So in, in a joint venture, kind of sticking with the idea of you, know, you have a, a capital partner and a developer partner who typically has the right to manage the company. Does anybody know? It's whatever they can be up the end. Exactly. Good. Yeah, good answer. It's kind of a trick question because it could it could be whatever the, the parties decide. So um, it, it depends largely on what the capital partner, the money partner's process is. Some of them have a preference. They're kind of hands off. And they don't want to do much. They're willing to cede a lot of their rights to the developer partner. But on the other hand, a lot of equity partners, capital partners, they insist on having essentially all the rights. And they, they can control every single um, decision that's being made by the company. So if you're going out as, let's say you're a developer, if, you're, if you want to be a developer and you're going to go out and find a joint venture partner, you can't just assume that because you're the developer that you're going to be able to just kind of run the show and call the shots. You have to really figure out what that equity partner is willing to do and you're going to negotiate a little bit, kind of end up in the middle. So you know, you, you have these situations where sometimes that could be partner can control everything, sometimes you don't control very much. Can you guys think of any topics where in almost any situation both partners would have a say? Doing what? Doing so like like in the uh, like in the real estate context. So let, let's say that uh, one of the, the partners wants to just dissolve the company and liquidate all the assets of, of the joint venture. So that sometimes that would be negotiated to become a joint benefit, to become a joint decision so that one of the parties can't just pull the plug on what's happening and come to a halt. Maybe I'll let us dance on the question. Maybe it might be a partner, may not. Want to have a say in something that they're not really experienced in. Mm -hmm. uh, if they don't really quite know about finance and the other person does, and they realize that the, the company may be insolvent, just as like a hypothetical, um, you wouldn't want somebody that's not experienced with finance trying to run the finance department um, in that sense. Yeah. They shouldn't have a, they probably say, maybe they shouldn't have a say in something that I really am not the expert in. Yeah, that that you're absolutely right, and that that's a conversation that happens all the time when you're negotiating joint venture agreements. I was having a conversation today, actually, with somebody we we're representing the equity partner, and the person I was negotiating with was representing the, the developer, and we're having a conversation about like our client, the equity investor, 
doesn't know what the day-to-day -day operation of an apartment building in Vancouver, Washington is like. You know, this is this is a private equity fund that sits in DC. This, the, you know, their business is to dump money into this, not to know the, the ins and outs of what happens in Vancouver, Washington. So, you know, in, in that sense, we said, look, like we don't even, want, we almost don't even want to be involved in this. We want to say that that you, Mr. Developer, are going to have an obligation to do it the right way, but we're not going to try to tell you exactly how to do it. So that's a good example. Another example is is leases. So, um, an, an equity investor might not want to have the right to to look at every single lease, approve every single lease, because they might not want the liability of getting involved in each lease, and they also probably don't have the time or the capacity or even the the care to look at it. Because if, let's say you're building a 300 unit apartment building, you're going to have leasing activity happening constantly. And each lease on its own, because they're apartments, they're relatively low value. And so that it's just not efficient for them to look at. So what a joint venture agreement will do is they'll say that the operating partner has the right to enter into leases as long as it meets this, these leasing guidelines that are attached to the joint venture agreement. So that, that's an example of you know, where, where you might want to give up some rights. So just to stay on track, we should uh, move on a little bit here. So Kind of switching gears from management, capital contributions and distributions. So th this is something that gets focused on from the outset of a transaction. Um, it, this isn't really legal stuff. This is pure business stuff. If you're going to be doing a real estate deal, you have to understand how capital contributions work, when you're required to do it, what happens if you don't do it, and then how do you get your money back out of the company. So I guess to, to start, what, what is a capital contribution? I know I've said that word, those words a lot. Does anybody know? Putting money into the company. Yeah, it's, put, it's putting money. It's, it's contributing. It's what it sounds like. It's contributing money, capital, into the joint venture. So let's say that you have an LLC as the joint venture. That's going to be made up of members of the LLC. So when the members, so in our examples, the equity investor and then the developer, when they each put their money into the joint venture, those are the capital contributions. You'll also hear the, the phrase capital calls a lot. What, what that means is for whatever reason, the venture needs more money. Um, that could be because if it's a development project that um, you had a cost overrun, something is costing more than you thought it was going to cost. Uh, you know, in, in that context, when you're negotiating a joint venture agreement, it's important to focus on you know, who's going to be responsible for making these capital contributions as a result of capital calls. So in, in some instances, for example, let's say you're building a project, you have a cost overrun, and you need to put more money in the venture, excuse me, Sometimes, depending on the structure of it, it could be that the developer has to put in 100% of the cost overruns, even if they only have a 10% you know, ownership interest in the joint venture. They have to put in 100%. So that, that's you know, essentially what, you're, what the, the parties are saying is that, look, developer, you're bringing this project to us. You better have gotten your numbers right. And if you didn't, you're going to be responsible for the, the excess of the costs to build this project. That, that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is you can you can split the cost over and you can a lot of equity partners for the last few years have been agreeing to actually go 50-50 on cost overruns with their developer partners. So it, it, it's all negotiable. Um, different equity partners will say they have different preferences, but but it's all negotiable and it's important to understand this concept, and if you're doing a real estate deal, to bring this up at the outset of a transaction, because if you don't, you could get down the road in your negotiation, you're spending a lot of legal fees, and you realize that your equity partner expects you to put in 100% of the overruns, and you thought you're gonna be putting in 50 and 50, and so that, that can change the whole calculus of, of how the deal is going to work. So, does anybody have an idea of what happens if, if you're required to put in money or to make a capital contribution, but you don't? Um, 
Yeah, exactly. Be a breach. And depending on the particular documents, there's different ramifications for that. Sometimes it's considered a, you know, a true breach, and the other party has all of the remedies that they would have as a result of any breach. And sometimes it's negotiated that it's treated a little bit different. Usually what happens from a practical perspective, and usually from a documentation perspective, when somebody fails to put in money when they're required to do so, is the other party, the party that did make their required contribution, is they can actually make a, they can make a, an additional contribution in the amount that the person that was supposed to put in the money did. So you're effectively diluting the person. So let's say that you started out, one party had 90%, every investor had 90% of the company, the other party had 10%. The 10% party doesn't make a required capital contribution, but the 90% partner does. And then they put in the amount that was supposed to put in, but wasn't. You could be diluting your developer partner and say that, let's say it was a 90-10, you could go down to like a 95-5 or however the math works out. But it can be, you know, to the point where you're effect effectively squeezing that partner out of out of the uh, the joint venture, which you know really is in nobody's interest. Um, I mean, sometimes equity investors might want to do that, but typically it's a sign that things are going bad. Um, another option, instead of trying to dilute the other party, is you can make a loan. They, they typically refer to them as member loans. So rather than making a contribution that dilutes the person, you say. Hey, I don't want to dilute you. So I'm gonna I'm gonna loan you the money that you're supposed to have put in. And then I'm gonna charge you interest. And it could be something like 20%, 25%, just a, a huge number that discourages people from doing it. Um, so the the benefit to the equity investor is that they're gonna be getting interest on the additional money that they put in that they didn't have to put in. And the upside for the developer is they're they're not getting completely diluted out and they have a chance to kind of claw back their position if they can raise some money to pay off the member. Check this on screen. Okay. Um, so now we started a little bit late, so I want to make sure we can get some important points here. So um, the, the waterfall, what this refers to is just what, when a bucket of money is available to distribute to the to the members. So at this point, the property is built, it's generating revenue, there's money to be distributed, um, and you just have to figure out where it goes. So a simple situation would be um, if there was just a one level waterfall, if um, let's say you have $100 in, then $90 would go to the equity investor, $10 would go to the um, developer, using a, a 90-10 kind of example like I've been using. But then you can have more complicated waterfalls include promotes and i know mark talked a little bit about promotes uh, with respect to funds you also see that come up in, in developments um, on a you know, asset by asset developments these are super important to developers if, if, if any of you are thinking about being a developer like this is a word you need to know is the is the promo so the idea is that it, it, it's it's a simple concept so let's say you're you're ordinarily only able to get 10% of the money that comes off the project because you have a 10% interest in the property. So you own 10%, the other party owns 90%. What a promote does is if the, if the property is performing at a high level, you start to get a disproportionately large piece of the money. So for example, let's say that uh, the property is doing well and the equity investor is hitting certain uh, target levels of IRR, internal rate of return, then instead of the cash going 90-10, it might go 80-20 or 70-30. And you can actually get to a position where the, if the property is performing very well, that the developer partner could be getting 50% of the cash that the project is spinning off rather than the 10%. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, in, in simple terms, uh, to combine maybe the like, term waterfall. Um, so if a property meets certain conditions, the promote is basically saying, we're going to change how the waterfall works. 
they're they're addition the way they think about it is they're kind of additional tiers of the waterfall. So it, and it's you can think of them as as hurdles. It's kind of mixing metaphors with waterfall and hurdles. But the idea is that if you satisfy one performance standard, then the developer gets a little bit larger share of the profits. If they had another, then they had yeah. So they hit certain conditions, the waterfall can change or go to a different kind of distribution. Yeah, the 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 um, way the money comes out of the waterfall changes. Yeah. Okay, so just to hit a couple other topics here um, before we switch gears into to leasing. So uh, in the joint venture agreement, so in addition to talking about management and talking about um, you know who, who the parties are involved, you have covenants. And you have covenants in any document. A covenant is just a promise. That's all it is. It's an agreement to do something or not to do something. Um, one thing that's one covenant that's very important in joint ventures, especially development oriented joint ventures, is a key person covenant. So what that is is where the developers, usually the developer partner, they agree that during the construction of the project or maybe even the entire duration of the joint venture, that certain people will be involved. And typically, it's going to be some high level person within the partner's organization and. The reason that they have that obligation to keep that person in there is because the equity investor would not have even done the deal had this certain person been there. Because you know we're dealing with companies all the time. At the end of the day, if you're going to build a project, it, these are like real people that actually have to go out and do it. And you're putting your trust in certain people that they can administer their company properly to make sure that that happens. Okay, so we're going to skip over a couple of these here in, in the interest of time. Um, one I wanted to mention was a non-compete covenant. This is also something that when you're first getting into your deal, you're exploring a relationship with a new partner, you want to make sure you understand what their, their non-compete uh, requirements are from the outset. And this is you know, similar to the non-compete con concept in an you know, employment context. That's where most people hear this phrase. But where, what this means in the real estate development context is that typically the equity partner does not want their developer partner to be going out and building and operating properties that could compete with the property that's the subject of the joint venture. So what people will typically do is they'll say, okay, the developer is not allowed to go out and, and develop another, let's say this is a, let's say the venture is for a multifamily project. The developer can't go develop another multifamily project within a three mile radius of this building so that we know that the developer is going to be paying the right amount of attention to our project and not you know doing not prioritizing other partners over us okay, okay so just to talk about um, exit rights briefly here so you have you have a project. You have two parties coming together to build a project. In a development context, the idea is is not necessarily that people are just gonna these two parties are gonna stay together for the whole time. Eventually, one party is gonna want to get out. Um, usually, both parties are gonna want to get out. They're gonna want to you know realize the the gains that they've been able to get as a result of, of building this project. But but sometimes. You have situations where one party wants to get out early. There's a few different ways to do that, and it depends on what your position is in the joint venture between the developer partner or the equity partner. These are some of the most highly negotiated aspects of um, a joint venture agreement. I, I won't go into the details in the interest of time, but just to touch on them. So a forced sale right, it's what it sounds like. It's that one party has the right to say, I want to sell this property, even over the objection of the other party. And sometimes um, parties will have the right to do that at any time. Sometimes it will be after the property has been fully leased, what they, what they refer to as stabilization. Um, sometimes it's, you know, it could be two years after stabilization. There, and you can get creative on how you structure it, but the idea is that Usually, one party is going to have the right to sell the property, and they're going to have some parameters around it. <clears throat> Another thing that you see come up in 
joint venture agreements a lot for exit rights are buy sells. So these can be very nuanced, but the idea is this, is that one party wants out, they send a notice to the other party and they say, we think the properties were, call it $10 million. And um, so now I've given this notice to you that I said, I want out, or I don't want to be a partner with you. That's probably a better way to put it. I don't want to be a partner with you anymore. You can either buy me out for $10 million or I get to buy you out for $10 million. And so the person sending the notice is kind of playing chicken with the person because they're saying, look, like you have to buy us out or we have to buy you out. And by them agreeing contractually to buy them out, if that other person chooses that option, you know, they could have millions of dollars on the line. So typically these buy sells work to the favor of equity investors, um, but you do see it come up and sometimes being raised by uh, developer partners as well. So it's about all we have time for today on here. So um, I guess before we end, does anybody have any questions? How do you estimate the amount? It's a great question. It depends. So um, sometimes the person delivering the buy sell notice, they can just choose a number. It doesn't have to be based on logic or anything. And they could put some ridiculously high number that they know that the other party is not going to be able to come up with. That can create problems elsewhere. Um, a lot of documents will say that it has to be based on a fair market value. And it might there might be some parameters on how to come up with that number, but I would say at least half of them it probably allows the person to just propose a number with the thinking that <clears throat> there's some safeguards there because if, if the party elects to um, not buy out the person that's delivering the notice, now the person delivering the notice has to pay this obscenely high price to the, to the other party. So there's some internal checks and balances. And uh, Let's do one more question and then we're, we're going to turn it over to Tricia for some please. Sorry? Promote. So the, the idea of a promote, put simply, is that it's a it's a right to a disproportionate amount of the revenue generated by the property, typically based on performance. All right, and I think that's all we have time for, guys. Hi, everyone. I'm Gigi Greenlee. Um, as with the other, some of the others you've heard from today, um, Mayor Brown, as um, Dan just told you, um, I started my career a few years ago with a generalized real estate practice. And at some point along the way, I decided I wanted to focus on leasing. And for the past 10 years, um, my practice has evolved exclusively into a commercial leasing practice. Um, as you're probably aware, a lease is an agreement where an owner of property conveys to another person, a third party, an interest to use um, that real property for a specified period of time. And um, you're probably familiar with the concept and this arrangement in terms of residential context, um, as most of you probably rented an apartment or a house at some time. Um, with respect to our legal practice in California, the type of leases we handle most commonly are commercial as opposed to residential. And commercial leases can really run the gamut, um, including, as you see listed on the slide, um, leasing for office space, retail, restaurant space, industrial space, warehouse, manufacturing, life science, and data center leasing. Um, there's no one size fits all um, type of documentation that can be applied across these industries. Um, so it can get pretty specialized. Um, I personally specialize in life science leasing, so laboratory and biotech. Um, and you know, to give you an example, like life science and lab tenants um, tend to use hazardous materials um, a lot more heavily than other users. So um, life science landlords tend to be more concerned about what their space is gonna look like when they get it back and that it's free of hazardous materials so they can lease it to somebody else without having um, any issues come up. 
from that. Um, data center leases have really, really um, intricate provisions regarding their utilities because they need uh, a lot of power for cooling their equipment. And um, retail leases, uh, Alex was just talking to you in the joint venture context about key persons um, in retail leasing. You might have concepts to very similar to that. Um, like for a restaurant, if there's a particular restaurant tour or chef that um, you want associated with that restaurant, you're going to bring that person in under your lease as a key person to keep them in um, involved in the operations during that lease um, to hopefully boost up profit and um, percentage rents that might get paid for the landlord. Um, so that's talking about who's involved. Uh, some of this is, is fairly obvious, but um, you know, there's various groups. The most obvious and integral are the landlord and the tenant, of course, um, but brokers uh, have a very important role in terms of helping uh, the landlord market the space um, and let, uh, helping the parties put together the terms of the transaction that um, will eventually be negotiated in the document, in the lease document. Um, landlords are also generally going to look to underwriters to assist them once potential tenants have been um, identified um, to review and determine their creditworthiness and among other things, and that they're financially viable in terms of meeting their lease obligations during the term of um, their lease. Tenants with stronger credit um, can enhance the value of a landlord's property, um, which is going to be an important factor for a landlord when they're um, eventually potentially looking to sell or to put the property into a joint venture situation. Um, in cases where a landlord is willing or in a position to accept a tenant that may not have as strong credit as they might like, um, underwriters are also going to help a landlord to determine what kind of security they should be collecting from that tenant um, in case things go wrong, uh, they've got a pot of uh, money or a guarantee to look to. Um, as attorneys, we are generally brought in uh, to the leasing process either at the letter of intent stage, which we'll talk about letters of intent, um, in order to help the parties negotiate uh, how that's going to look at the business level. Um, otherwise, we're going to get involved once that letter of intent or term sheet is put together um, so that we put together the actual lease document and, and negotiate it um, through to completion. Um, there are design and construction teams that uh, might be getting involved uh, depending on the nature of the transaction. Uh, they might be on the landlord tenant on both sides. Uh, so for example, if a landlord has land, uh, just vacant land on which it's willing to construct a building, um, it's going to have its people, its design and development people uh, construct the building, design the building, construct the building and potentially uh, construct the improvements uh, within the space for the tenant. Um, or the landlord may construct the building and the tenant's gonna do its own improvements in the space. Um, if buildings are already existing, uh, we might still have development um, designing construction teams involved to, to get the space ready for any coming time. Uh, the asset management folks probably typically don't get involved until after uh, the leases are negotiated and finalized, but for certain specialized properties, they may get involved with in the lease negotiation stage um, to ensure that the tenant's expectations are aligned with the operational realities with respect to the, the space being leased. As I just touched on, um, the commercial leasing process generally follows a fairly typical process starting with the listing of the space and related marketing by the brokers, the preparation of the letter of intent or term sheet, preparation of the lease, and in some cases, the design and construction of lease space for delivery to the tenant. 
And the most length, most lengthy part of that process is typically the preparation and negotiation of the lease itself, which will take six to eight weeks on average for what I see, but can take six, nine, 12 months, depending on um, this, the strength of the parties um, and the complexity of the transaction. Um, the initial terms of a leasing transaction will generally be outlined on the term sheet or letter of intent that I've been referring, referring to. And um, they'll be limited in nature and they're not gonna include key provisions or a ton of detail that everyone's gonna focus on later when they're negotiating the lease document. The key thing with respect to both um, the term sheets and letters of intent is that they're non-binding. Um, regarding, or, or with no matter how much detail goes into the term sheet of letter of intent, it's really important that everybody's clear and it include, they include language on some level that they are non-binding. So nobody can force the other uh, to move forward with the transaction um, unless they've entered into a lease document. Um, as reflected on the slide, the letter of intent or term sheet is gonna give everyone the really basic terms of um, who, what, when, where. Um, including the description of the space that's going to be subject to the lease, the project where the, the space is going to be located, um, the permitted use of, of that space, whether that's going to be that office, life science, retail, et cetera, and um, the term of the lease, how long uh, the tenant's going to have to use that space, how much uh, rent they're going to pay during the term, when the lease is expected to start, um, and in relation to that, when the tenant is going to be expected to start paying rent. Um, it's also probably going to get into some detail about um, the condition of the space and what condition uh, the space should be in when it gets delivered to the tenant, whether they're going to build it out um, in terms of their own improvements in the space or that the landlord is going to do it. If the landlord is going to build out the space for the tenant, um, generally they're going to give a budget to the tenant uh, that they can use as a pot of money to get those improvements done in the space. Um, and on occasion, tenants will just take space as is. Like for office, office tenants it may not make a big difference how an office looks, is configured or anything like that. So they'll just take it the way the last tenant left it. Um, so I mentioned they'll touch on um, how much the tenant will pay in rent and how much that rent will increase and the mechanism for the increases over the term and uh, what components there might be of, of that rent. So typically in an office lab sort of situation, you have just a base rent um, that can range, that's gonna range depending on your market um, for lab space in North Carolina. For instance, you're gonna get about $35, $36 a square foot on average, where in Boston for the same space, you're gonna get $110 a square foot. So um, these tend to be important um, items that uh, you see in the letter of intent or term sheet. Any questions so far? Um, leases, end up getting categorized based on how the landlord's operating costs are treated. So the first one we have here is a triple net lease. So there's the base rent component that I was just talking about. Um, and that is what we call net of operating expenses. So that means that all of the operating costs are that the landlord incurs during the term are gonna get passed on to the tenants. Um, these costs include taxes, the cost of insurance policies and premiums, the cost of maintenance, repairs of the building and the premises, and the day-to-day -day operations of the project. Um, operating expenses are divided among the tenants of a particular property based on their pro rata share of the lease space. So, for example, tenant A leases 10000 um, square feet in a 50,000 square foot building, they're going to pay 20% of the um, expenses incurred um, monthly. 
the second is gross lease. And um, a gross lease is going to reflect a rent amount that includes a predetermined amount of court expenses payable during the term based on landlord's uh, estimate uh, historical data on historical data. If, if costs go up, uh, for the landlord during that time, it's not going to be able to recoup costs from the tenant who's um, locked into that, that rent amount based on that estimate. So you tend to see this structure most often for industrial and retail leases. And then there's gross for the base year. Um, so the no, there's no operating expenses payable by the tenant for it might be the first year or year a little bit more year plus um, after the lease starts. And then after that, the landlord can only pass through charges uh, over the increase that are reflect the increase over the, the costing for during that initial year. So an example of this, let's say that there's a lease that has a 2022 20, base year and started on January 1, 2022, uh, the tenant will pay um, only base rent until the 31st, uh, December 31st, 2022. Okay. And at the end uh, of 2022, beginning of 2023, the landlord's gonna calculate uh, what its operate, operating costs were for 2022. And starting uh, January 1 of 23, for the 2023 calendar year, the tenant is going to pay its share of the delta between the landlord's operating costs uh, incurred in 2023 and those that were incurred in 2022. So if landlord's operating costs for 2022 were a million dollars and 2023 were 1.2, uh, the tenant is gonna pay its share of that $200,000 increase. Um, tenants are gonna be concerned about expenses. So um, these provisions relating um, to this can involve extensive and highly negotiated provisions um, regarding what items can and can't be passed through as part of operating costs. So there's no true triple net where every single thing um, gets passed through. Um, and they'll get into a lot of detail about possible landlords required to maybe amortize over the terminal lease rather than charge through in our, what any one particular year. Um, like cost for capital repairs and expenses, like maybe roof replacement of the building, like really big ticket items. And um, they'll get into tenant rights to audit what the expenses are so that if they um, have any questions about whether they might be overpaying, um, they can um, request records and audit for a particular year and perhaps get credits or end up having to pay more. So in terms of the basic lease terms, um, documentation can end up all over the map due to a number of different factors, but um, they're going to integrate the business terms agreed to by the parties in the letter of intent or term sheet that we've talked about. Um, so you see listed on this first slide some of the more basic terms we've already um, heard about. Identifying the space being leased, how long the term is, in what condition it's going to get delivered to the tenant, um, what the tenant's obligations are with respect to operating costs, whether it's triple net gross, gross um, with base year, the size of the security deposit they're required to deliver at the front end, or an alternative security, whether a guarantee from another party might be required. Um, there's going to be language dictating the use we talked about um, that the tenant can use the space for. And this is important for a few reasons. Um, one, certain properties might be located in areas zoned for a particular use. So um, for example, if the building is in its zone for office, uh, you can't just decide to use portions of that building for retail without getting some sort of um, specialized variance from local government. Uh, also, buildings tend to be built, constructed to accommodate a certain use um, that may not um, be conducive to a different type of use. And a good example of that is office buildings. Um, you can't just convert space on a, in an office building uh, and have a lab tenant come in and start doing lab, operating a lab in there because 
um, labs tend to need way more robust infrastructure. Um, they're going to need more electricity, uh, air exchange requirements, and um, backup systems in case uh, the main systems go down. Uh, parking rights are important, and oftentimes there is limited parking available at any given property. So leases are going to be pretty clear about the number of parking spaces that a tenant is um, allowed to, to use during the term, and um, sometimes uh, requirements for monthly payment of park for parking spaces. Um, standard lease provisions include language regarding uh, who between landlords is going to be responsible for paying utilities, making repairs and maintenance to the lease space, the building, and the common areas of the project. Um, so th those, those are all things we're going to uh, see in our lease document. Uh, there will be provisions dictating the amount of insurance that the require that the landlord and the tenant are required to maintain um, during the term. So landlords are typically going to be responsible at a minimum for maintaining the property insurance, covering the building itself. Um, so the, just the building structure and frame, um, the core uh, systems in that building, and the tenants will typically be required to maintain insurance to cover the property within their space, um, along with general liability insurance, workers' comp, and, and other standard policies like that. Uh, we're gonna have C provisions regarding assignment and subletting. So landlords are gonna want to restrict tenants and who they can sublease or assign to. They don't want their tenants uh, turning around and, and making leasing a business themselves. So if they do sublease, they'll often have to profit share um, any profits they make with the landlord. Uh, we're gonna see pretty detailed provisions uh, for defaults and remedies, what happens if the tenant stops paying rent or does some other sort of wrong thing, uh, breaches the lease. Uh, and those are gonna be pretty specific based on uh, what state you're in. There's also gonna be a fair number of specialized provisions in a lease, including um, extension rights, uh, expansion rights that uh, tenants would be able to uh, take advantage of. Uh, these typically ex extensions and expansions, those really only benefit tenants. So landlords are going to try and keep them out of their lease documents and tenants are oftentimes trying to get them in so that they can have the ultimate amount of flexibility um, during the term of their lease. Um, so this has been a really basic overview and very quick one, um, but the reality is that with respect to leasing, uh, there's a, a lot of different in intricacies and factors that are going to um, dictate the detail and complexity of the transaction and the documentation. Anybody have any questions? All right, thank you. Uh, I guess raise your hand if you borrowed money. That's like, yeah, you're in school, so chances are you borrowed money. Uh, if you borrowed money that's secured by a property, yeah, it's a little bit like a mortgage, right? So um, any idea why you would borrow money to buy a property? or secured, rather secured by real property, not necessarily to buy real property. I've given away one reason. One reason you would borrow money secured by real property is because you're going to acquire that real property. So when people buy houses, they typically uh, borrow money, a mortgage, um, and use that money to buy the property and the bank that they borrow the money from takes a deed of trust, and records that against the house, right? And it's no different with commercial property. I uh, I was using a hotel in downtown Los Angeles as an example before. If you were going to uh, buy a hotel in downtown Los Angeles, chances are you'd have a certain amount of equity or cash that you put in the, into the transaction and you would borrow the rest of the money from a bank or a hedge fund, perhaps Mark's private equity fund, 
And then um, that private equity fund or bank would take a deed of trust and record that against your property. And if you fail to pay them, they could potentially take the property by foreclosing on that deed of trust. So acquisition is one type of financing. Raise your hand if you know of any other reason why you would borrow money secured by a real property. Yeah. One open business. Okay, sure. You're borrowing money against your property because you're using it for uh, business efforts. Like say if uh, you had that hotel downtown and you refinanced the property and you wanted to expand um, your restaurant offerings, you wanted to improve uh, the, the quality of the furnishings inside of the rooms, you wanted to offer like a yoga business studio or something like that or a gym. There's, um, you could improve your own property or you could borrow against your home perhaps and then start a business with that. That used to be the American dream. Um, so that's one, so acquisition, borrowing to, or refinancing to extract equity to either improve your property or start a business. Any other ideas? Construction, that's what I do. So, uh, you could be borrowing money um, to build a project. Um, and so then when you're borrowing money to build a project, your lender is going to have a lot of conditions that you have to meet to uh, uh, increase your loan. So a construction loan isn't doled out. Say you're borrowing $300 million to build an office building, right? The, the construction lender isn't just going to give you that $300 million. They're going to make advances, uh, you know, in increments that'll be maybe $10 million minimum. And they'll want to make sure that you're using that money to pay your general contractor. They're going to want to review your general contract. They're going to want to make sure that you get lien waivers uh, from all of the people who are performing work at your construction site. Uh, so that's the, the main difference. Construction financing is a lot more complex because you do have that sort of incremental financing aspect. So how would you finance a real estate transaction? I mean, an acquisition, building something, uh, you're refinancing. Well, what, what are the different types of financings? We, we've talked about loans, but does anybody know any different way to raise money for a real estate transaction? Okay, you could do a sale lease back, which is kind of a disguised loan, right? You sell a property to your lender, then you lease it back from them on a long-term lease. So your rent payments are like interest payments, right? And uh, if they, if you default on those payments, then your lender or your landlord takes the property back. So it's, it's sale lease back is kind of a disguised loan. You've got joint ventures. That's a, you can find Mark's private equity fund, another hedge fund, whatever. And you can uh, get them to enter into a joint venture agreement with you and raise money that way. Uh, you can get a preferred equity transaction, which is like a joint venture transaction, except the, the preferred equity provider is going to have more draconian remedies. They might have a right to take over the management of the joint venture, or they might have the ability to take a pledge and just remove you completely from your joint venture if you, if you mess up. Uh, then there's ground leasing. You can... Um, uh, basically sell the property um, and lease it back like a like a sale lease back transaction. Um, so what are the rights of the lender in the property? So if, uh, if you've got a loan, what's what's the instrument? Anybody remember what it's called? The, the instrument or the collateral for the real estate loan is the property itself. Um, the joint venture we talked about that is uh, economic rights, kickout rights, and buyout rights. I think Alex just discussed that with you. Preferred equity, you've got control rights, kickouts, buyouts, pledges, uh, ground lease. Uh, you've got a reversion right at the end of your ground lease, or if there's a default under the ground lease. So how do you document a uh, financing transaction? That, that's my job, right? Uh, business people come up with the loan, 
uh, credit committee approves it, and then it goes into documentation. Um, so what what's the, remember with the purchase and sale agreement, we started with the letter of intent. With a loan, you're going to, or, or any financing really, you're gonna start instead with a term sheet, and you're gonna go quickly from a term sheet uh, once that's signed up to a checklist with all of the documents and the diligence that you need to see, then you're going to have documents with a loan. It's loan documents with the joint venture. It's a LLC agreement uh, or an LP agreement. And then you're going to, once you finalize the terms of your documents, you're going to close. Uh, so let's start with what goes into financing term sheet. Okay, uh, I'm going to go pretty quickly because we'll get towards the end of the class. So you're going to want uh, the amount of your financing, the term, most loans, refinance loans and commercial real estate are 10 years. Um, hence the, the name of Mark's uh, private equity fund is 3650 re 3650 being 10 years. They make 10 year loans. Uh, term is... Um, uh, in construction, it's more like three to five years. You'll have extension options. Um, you'll have fees, closing fees, uh, exit fees, uh, minimum interest fees. You'll have interest uh, payments, terms, um, diligence requirements, confidentiality, whether the term sheet's binding or non-binding, uh, whether... Um, the amount of the deposit that your borrower is going to need to put up and any, any breakup fee. Uh, one trick on term sheets, if you really want to um, get your counterparty in the deal, is to have a large breakup fee kind of buried in the back of your term sheet. Um, that ensures that um, they're not going to walk away. Uh, okay, so what goes in a checklist that constitutes diligence for real estate finance transactions? Very similar to a purchase and sale uh, diligence because as a lender, you're got, you might end up owning the property. As a joint venture ec uh, equity provider, you might end up in charge of the property or owning the property outright, not as a partner. Um, so you're going to want loan documents or finance documents. You're going to look at all the documents on title. You're going to look at a survey. You're going to get a survey certified to you. You're going to get a zoning report, and you're going to get that zoning report certified to you. You're going to look at the organizational chart for your borrower, what all the entities are and who actually owns them. Usually you want to go up to a warm body of the LLCs, the corporations, and the LPs. Um, you're going to get all the documents that back up that organizational chart. You're going to want to get legal opinions as to authority and forcibility of your transaction. You're going to get uh, property reports like property condition reports, uh, phase one environmental reports. You're going to want uh, to see property level contracts like the security, the landscaping and construction fencing. Uh, any sort of property management agreement, any sort of listing or leasing agreement. Um, then you'll have your closing documents. You'll open an escrow. So you have an escrow agreement and a settlement statement. A settlement statement is like a sources and uses uh, statement. And it details all the money that's going to be paid out of your closing, where it's coming from and where it's going. Um, you want tax returns for your borrower. You want to do searches and background checks on your borrower and every entity in the um, equity stack. All right. So what are finance documents? Anybody ever seen finance documents? Okay. Loan agreement, the promissory note, the loan agreement and deed of trust are the most important documents. The deed of trust is actually going to get recorded. If you don't have a deed of trust recorded, you are not going to have a security instrument uh, interest in the property, and you're going to have no collateral for your loan. The promissory note is the promise to pay. Uh, oftentimes, you need a promissory note, and in some states, you have to show the promissory note to the court in order to be able to foreclose on your collateral. The loan agreement is where most of the terms of the loan are going to be, uh, and usually there are 100 or 200 page documents. A carve out guarantee is a document that you get from an entity or a person that has uh, enough money to uh, pay for your loan if it goes bad. And the carve-out guarantee 
um, it, it covers certain bad acts that can be taken by or on behalf of your borrower. And if your borrower does those things, like file bankruptcy, um, uh, challenge the enforceability of the loan documents, commit fraud, then you're going to have, be able to sue this uh, entity or person um, that's in the equity of your borrower. And you wanna make sure that they have control over your borrower because they may, one of the worst things that can happen as a lender is your borrower files bankruptcy. So one of the most important carve outs in your carve out guarantee is your borrower filing bankruptcy. Now, if you have a guarantor that can't control whether your borrower files bankruptcy or not, um, then they don't care if, if somebody who doesn't isn't on the guarantee can file the borrower for bankruptcy, then they don't care because they don't have full recourse to the lender from their own pocket. So you always want somebody who controls the borrower to be your guarantor. Uh, so they have skin in the game if there were to be a, a bankruptcy file. Um, you got assignments of all your contracts. You have a, an indemnity in case there's environmental issues with the property and a joint venture agreement. It's you know similar documentation, just the main documents, a joint venture agreement. You don't have a promissory note and you're not going to have a deed of trust. The sale lease back, you'll you're selling the property to your lender, so you'll have a purchase and sale agreement. Um and that'll have a deed, a bill of sale, FERPTA and assignments, all the purchase and sale documents. Then you'll have a triple net lease, a memo of lease, and a ground lease that come back. Uh, how do you close a real estate financing? It's, it's similar to a purchase and sale. You go through escrow, you use a settlement statement or sources and uses that, that tells you where all the money's supposed to go. Everybody signs it. Um, and then you sign all your documents and you record the recordable documents like your deed of trust. And I believe that's it. So that's it for um, uh, financing. Wow. Maybe I pushed the wrong button. No, that's it. Okay. Any questions about financing your real estate transaction? Okay. I know this has been a lot. This covers basically the full gambit of what you could do with real estate if you go into a real estate career. So please, we provided, the slides will be provided to you. Uh, let me see if I can find the QR code so we can all scan that. Uh, it's not the last slide on this one. I'll share it on the screen. Okay, so we'll share the QR code. And um, in our bios, you can, you'll find our email addresses of all the presenters. If you end up going into real estate, we're here for you. We can help you out, uh, mentor you. Please feel free to reach out to us. But do get that QR code, most importantly. One second, guys. 